Give it a couple of minutes. We'll just allow a, uh, another few seconds for some, some further guests to join, but thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm just gonna allow about another 30 seconds or so to see how many people uh, still log in, hopefully a few more. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Okay, well, we're a couple minutes past 12, so why don't we go ahead and get started and then other participants will join as we go along. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, it is a real honor and a privilege to be here representing the Institute of Directors Property and Built Environment Group. My name is Richard Nelson. I'm the chair of the group. Um, and welcome to UK Turkey Real Estate Investment Opportunities. We are honored to be joined by our colleagues from Turkey, from DEIC, the Foreign Economic Relations Board of Turkey, and Gilder, the Association of Real Estate Investors of Turkey. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to give you all the agenda for the day, I'm just doing a quick opening right now, and then I'll quickly hand over to the moderator of the day, uh, Mrs. Aslam Gokce. She's managing partner of Cor Corpus Invest and also a member of Gilder and Dek. Um, and then we'll have presentations about five to 10 minutes each from uh, Osman Oke, Alistair Elder, Mehmet Kalyantu, myself, and then back for some question and answers at the end. And, and Aslam will do the introductions of all the speakers. Um, just to also let everyone know, um, the Q&A function in Zoom is available. You'll see, you should see a link somewhere on your screen for Q&A please put any questions you'd like to ask to the panel in the Q&A box, and we will come back at the end, uh, 1250, um, to look at some of those questions, and hopefully we can answer everyone's questions, uh, and if not, we'll do our best to come back afterwards um, with answers as a follow-up for everyone. So um, with that, I'd like to hand over to Aslam to give a bit of an introduction and to introduce the speakers. Aslam, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Good afternoon, everybody. It's also an uh, honor and privilege for me too to be in this webinar together with you and thank you for joining us today. As Richard mentioned, today we are aiming to discuss the collaboration opportunities between the UK and Turkey and uh, in real estate and construction industries, as well as uh, the prospects for the future bilateral trade in these sectors. And we will also have a comprehensive introductions of the four institutions by their high level representatives. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, I would like to start with Mr. Alistair Elder. He is representing IOD uh, Institute of Directors. He is a non-executive director and board advisor at the Institute of Directors uh, and at National Expert Advisory Group. And he is also the managing partner of SGI Partners. Uh, Mr. Osman Okyay, uh, he is the chairman of Turkey uh, UK Business Council under Foreign Economic Relations Board of Turkey, they. He is also the vice chair of Kale Group, which is a uh, diversified holding from construction materials to defense and high tech industries. Uh, Mr. Richard Nelson, yourself, uh, our host today, uh, he is the chairman of IAD Property and Built Environment Group, and he is also the managing director of Abyss Global. And uh, Mr. Mehmet Kalyoncu, he is the chairman of Gioder, the Association of Real Estate Investment Companies of Turkey, and he is also the board member of Kalyon <laughs> Holding one of the biggest construction companies of Turkey, which is also a partner of the new Istanbul airport. And uh, I am myself, Özlem Gökçe. I'm the managing partner of Corvus Invest, 
a UK-based real estate investment and development company. I'm also a board member of Turkey and UK Business Council of DAIC, and uh, I'm the ambassador of GEODER for the UK and Europe. As you all know, we, uh, following the Brexit, UK and Turkey has signed the free trade agreement among ourselves and in, in December 2020, which follows up a similar procedures uh, to the pre-Brexit conditions, which actually provided a smooth transition process. Although Turkey is not a European Union country, since we have a customs union agreement with the uh, European Union, this agreement had to wait until the official start of Brexit. But then uh, it became the first to be signed just after Brexit. That shows how both countries give importance to the trade and business relations between uh, the two, two countries. Following of our first contacts between DEIC, uh, Turkey UK Business Council and IOD towards the end of last year, two institutions agreed on working together for fostering economic and trade relations. And we decided to focus on several sectors and contributing on collaboration opportunities between the UK and Turkey. Among many important industries, such as, as you know, automotive, white appliances and textile are very crucial for our uh, trade uh, relations between U the UK and Turkey. Construction and real estate industries also offer appealing collaboration opportunities. In that regard, IOD's Property and Built Environment Group and GEODER will provide today the sectoral angles of the opportunities that we are going to discuss in our webinar. This webinar is also, we see it as a kickoff for the collaboration among the, these high level and influential institutions for a series of activities that we are planning ahead. In that regard, we aim to introduce these prominent inst uh, institutions uh, by their top level representatives and focus on the opportunities of the real estate and construction industries. I would like to start with Osman Bey. Uh, and uh, if we can have an introduction of DEIC, as well as a focus on uh, Turkey, UK Business Council, and uh, following that, uh, Osman Bey, since you have a time constraint, I would like to address my following question as well to you. Uh, in the perspective of the track record of the uk turkey trade relations and volumes, how do you see the impact of the Brexit and what could, have been, uh, what could be done additionally to improve the effectiveness of the existing free trade agreement? Um, thank you, Azam Hanım, uh, and uh, dear panelists and dear uh, guests, distinguished guests. I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar organized by uh, the UK UK Business Council, uh, GEODER, and the Institute of Directors, uh, focusing on opportunities on investment and trade cooperation between Turkey and the United Kingdom on real estate. I would like to start by thanking our moderator. Ms. Özlem Gökçe, who has worked tirelessly to organize this webinar and bring us together. I also would like to thank the other speakers from IOD and GEODER who have spared the time to be with us today. I'm sure today's discussion will be insightful and informative for those who are interested in the matter at hand. I'm sure you're all aware real estate investments in the United Kingdom and Turkey are amongst the most vital and lively areas of interest for investors from both countries. London and Istanbul distinguish themselves as two of the most active metropolitan areas and real estate markets in the world, while the rest of the markets remains ample and strong. Thus, the real uh, estate sector stands out as an area full of important opportunities to bolster the, old, the already strong trade and economic ties between Turkey and the United Kingdom. Dear guests, the current trade and economic relations between the two countries are remarkable. United Kingdom is one of Turkey's top export markets, whereas United Kingdom is the largest origin of foreign direct investment FDI following into, uh, flowing into Turkey. In the recent past, with the signing of the 
current FTA following Brexit, we were able to protect this invaluable relationship moving forward as the two governments will soon start negotiating an expanded FTA that will hopefully include services and digital services. More opportunities will arise in the near future for many Turkish and British businesses. As the day Turkey United Kingdom Business Council, we work to strengthen the economic and trade relations between Turkey and the United Kingdom. Through the events like this webinar, investment conferences, governmental consultations, and much more, we aim to prosper our, our respective countries and economies. We are here to support our member companies. Finishing my remarks, I wish everyone a great webinar, and I look forward to hearing how the business, businesses from the two countries can find ways of collaboration in the face of current business environment. And uh, coming to your question, Özmanım, uh, I believe uh, Brexit will only strengthen Turkey, Turkey, UK business, uh, UK trade and investment relations uh, much further. Uh, uh, the reason for that, the reason which makes me hopeful actually, is that uh, uh, Turkey is chosen as one of the target markets uh, in the UK after you know following the Brexit deal, and uh, and uh, both governments have a very strong commitment to increase the trade and investment between two countries. The other reason which makes me very uh, again hopeful for the future of Tur Turkey UK uh, business relations is that uh, the capabilities both countries uh, uh, put forward, uh, bring on the table, uh, are very complementary. So uh, when you have such a, uh, such, such a set of capabilities uh, which complement each other, uh, there's always business uh, followed by. So um, I also would like to emphasize one more point, which is uh, the third country uh, 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 cooperations. Uh, I believe Turkey and UK uh, has a great future uh, uh, in in the third markets. You know, great business future, business potential in the third markets, uh, mainly in Africa, CIS, CIS countries. You know, Central Asian uh, countries, uh, Turkic republics. And, uh, and the Balkans, you know, uh, in many geographies in the world, I think Turkish and UK companies uh, can, uh, can cooperate and can, uh, can undertake uh, very important projects and become very successful. So thank you very much for having me here today. And, uh, and I wish everyone a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Osman Bey, uh, for this sound uh, information about uh, Turkey-UK uh, relations, trade relations. Actually, uh, Turkey has just shifted its name uh, from Turkey to Turkey. So, I mean, uh, we are uh, starting to get used to it, actually, in our uh, speeches in English as well. So, I mean, uh, it would be uh, something new for our audience, especially attending from the UK. So uh, now a country is changing its uh, name and uh, it's officially uh, changed, actually. So that's why, I mean, we are using uh, Turkey instead of Turkey in our uh, speeches. So uh, I will uh, come to uh, you, actually, Alistair, uh, to know about uh, more about uh, Institute of Directors, especially for our, our audience from Turkey. I'm sure everybody knows uh, who are attending from the UK, uh, who is IOD, one of the uh, very prominent, very top uh, institutions in, in the UK. But uh, can you give a kind of information about IED background information? And also, I would like to address uh, a similar question to you, uh, apart from uh, what uh, Osman Bey uh, told about uh, what is a perspective about uh, Turkey, UK uh, trade relations. I would like to ask uh, the same question to you, in, uh, including uh, what kind of opportunities from your angle uh, can be more uh, in the coming future. The floor is yours, Alistair. Thank you. Can you? Ah, 
thank you very much, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thanks for joining. And, and Osman, thank you very much for your kind words, and Oslam, uh, yours as well. Um, a quick introduction, um, as the screen says, um, I'm part of the National um, Expert Advisory Group on Trade for the Institute of Directors, supporting um, the, the Head of Governance and Policy, Dr. Roger Barker, Kitty Usher, the Chief Economist and the DG, um, in providing members' insights as to the various aspects of domestic and international trade that are going on right now, particularly around the free trade agreements in the post-Brexit um, environment. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, if I just talk um, a couple of slides about the Institute of Directors, uh, we're a, a members organization focused on individual directors who happen to be parts of companies. We're not a company organization in that way. We, we focus on the directors of companies and we have a royal charter. Um, we've got a number of objectives um, in terms of the Institute. Uh, and first and foremost is uh, around that governance piece about being the best directors we can be and, and building the best companies that we can build and therefore we grow trade and investment um, that way for our skill set um, is is of that particular standard we also um, look at deeply into research and um, into governance and how uh, the law can be shaped in terms of making sure that companies follow good practices and sound practices as, as we are an international trading um, um, country, it is very, very important that we, we follow global standards and indeed in some cases we set standards uh, and it's all about standards alignment. Post-Brexit is all about standards as well. Um, we do do a lot in terms of um, speaking to the government as well um, and we, the core benefit of all the three areas, ultimately the membership um, get the benefit of all of that support that the organization provides, either from the IOD staff themselves or from um, various people who um, volunteer as ambassadors and branch chairs. So in addition to the trade work I do, I'm also the governance and policy ambassador for the Institute of Directors in Sussex um, in the south of England, where I live. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we, we redid our strategy a couple of years ago and we've tried to narrow down into three key areas the main things that we do on behalf of our members and that is uh, we, we connect we develop and we influence so today's webinar uh, primarily focuses on connect and influence so we're connecting members with um, our, our turkish friends um, to talk about opportunities and how we might trade together and invest together in the future and also understand the challenges that we face as a shared business community as well. Um, the develop piece again is around, we have a massive program of education and professional development uh, leading up to the chartered director um, uh, qualification, which is a, a hefty qualification and it carries a lot of weight in boardrooms across the UK and further afield. Internationally, we have many international students um, who follow the chartered director path Influence um, is an area I touched on previously regarding the working with other trade bodies, but also with the governments, uh, the UK government, be it regional or local or national government. We work very, very closely with government and meet business ministers and Ministry of Finance ministers on a regular basis to share the members' um, concerns about potential charities, but also where we see um, opportunities in the future. Um, right now, our key challenges for our members are the is the EU relationship, it's the post-Brexit um, relationship. Most of our members trade internationally with mostly EU countries, which then presents the opportunity of um, non-EU markets and how we may develop our trade capacity and capability there. Um, the cost of business in terms of taxation and energy prices. Um, Investment in skills and training are challenges and opportunities for UK companies. Um, and I'm saying, I'm sure that a lot of what I'm saying right now rings true with our, our friends from Turkey who follow, have the same challenges in terms of you running your own business, availability of good staff, skilled staff, maintaining good taxation levels on business and so on. So we talk a lot with government 
about these key challenges. And one of the members benefits that we have is a thing called Policy Voice, where we send out a questionnaire every few weeks asking about what are the key challenges, which markets are you trading with, which are more difficult, what's your level of economic confidence with the UK economy, your own business, the global economy, and so on and so forth. And that helps us inform our thinking when we start talking to, to the UK government, the different departments, be it Department for Business or be it the, the Ministry of, of, of Finance. These are really, really important outputs for it. The members, we have over 20,000 members spread across the UK, and the, the vast majority of them are um, mostly in the south of England, be it London or across the south. But we do have a very strong footprint in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, in Wales, in the north of England. So when you talk um, as a Turkish business, when you're talking to the IOD, you're not just talking to the, the south where the, the major part of the economy is, uh, concentrated in certain areas, but the entire UK um, has a lot to offer Turkey um, across across the board. So we are very much a national organisation, and that's something that's really important for international organisations when they're coming into the UK to look at. Um, next slide, if I may, please. So we've been going 100 years, but as we know, organisations um, actually American law, a, a corporate is actually a person and the IOD um, has its own character and its own way of behaving. It's its own individual, if you like. Um, but the feedback we get from members uh, can be summarized in the three points there that people feel that they're part of a community of like minds. They understand we're all facing the same challenges. We're all collaborating to work together on the same opportunities. Um, Richard runs his own company, I run my own company. Um, but we get supported by the IOD and we rely on each other to be able to work together to do that as a, as a business to business, if you like. Um, we, we are regarded as an authority. The government looks at us uh, with a high level of respect. They value our opinion on policy matters, um, but they also value the work we do in terms of professional development uh, in making sure that people become better directors uh, and, and generate bigger businesses that ultimately generate more taxes for the UK government, let's face it, at the end of the day. Um, and if you put the two of those together, you, you build a movement um, of, of like-minded people. Um, uh, and we all want to create better business, more sustainable business, uh, and more opportunities for those business and look outside of the UK, not just in, in the UK. Um, next slide, please. Um, internationally, we have various footprints uh, around the world and many we have many international um, IOD members and some of those countries are mentioned here and, and hopefully we'll be adding Turkey to this particular slide um, in the very, very near future. But we've got a broad cross section of individuals and a broad cross section of nationalities who are members. So we are um, as many of people from DAKE members who have been posted in the past in the UK have been members of the of the IOD when they were posted here. So I think that there's some value there. So we, we're trying to grow this particular area um, as well, because uh, trade is a global phenomenon. It is does not stop at Dover. It, it starts at Dover, uh, if you like, uh, put it that way. So this is what we've our current footprint. And we've got a, a big international team. Um, Andrew Lambert's the chair of the London Group for International Trade, which is a very large group within the whole IOD. And we have a, a, another colleague, David Stringer-Lamar, who's the international trade advisor. So what we're trying to do on two levels is expand our international footprint in terms of governance, the professional development, um, getting people involved in our chartered director program and so on and so forth. But then from that will come the economic trade and investment collaboration that we're talking about today. Um, next slide. So, as the IOD in DAKE, we're, we're focused on shared objectives. As Oslin mentioned earlier, that there's a series of events have taken place and will take place in different sectors. And we've got shared objectives ultimately coming up to the free trade agreement, the renegotiation of that next phase and 2.0. So we each have strengths with other comparative trade bodies. So we work very closely with CBI and British Chambers of Commerce and others in the UK, and we work closely with government, and we work closely with Parliament as well. So the all-party parliamentary group on trade and investment, of which I'm a contributor to, um, uh, the co-chair is Viscount Waverley, who has spoken at a previous event 
um, an IED Turkey event. And he's also the co-chair of the parliamentary group on Turkey as well. Um, so uh, there's a lot of involvement of government and, and parliament uh, that we can bring. Um, but also what we want to do is promote that economic trade and business information to the areas you know, developing events such as this. But also the plan in the future would be to develop um, investment conferences, perhaps one in the UK one year, then one in Turkey the next year and so on. So we want to develop a process where we're at a policy level, we're working together, but equally we're also working together on a trade and investment um, basis. And in the future, if there are, there's a plane with a, with a bunch of IED members going off to Turkey and, and a bunch of DAKE members coming from Turkey to here, then that would be absolutely fantastic. And we're actually trading together as well as doing the policy stuff. So these are the outcomes. The objectives are there, but the outcomes are better trade, better investment and better working together. And that's that was my final slide. So to answer your question of some, the, the, the big area of the IOD members often focus on is, is the services area. Many of our members are services. We have a strong contingent in terms of manufacturing and engineering, but we also have a big contingent on the services area. So the some of the priorities for the next round of negotiation, and you know we hope to form um, a joint business working group with all the UK trade bodies and DAKE, so that our businesses and investors are aligned in our messaging to our government. So the big area for us moving forward would, would be the enhancement of the services relationship but also um, to take uh, uh, full knowledge from Turkey in terms of how UK companies can collaborate even more in terms of manufacturing and engineering, um, B2B, B2C, B2G. So really the opportunities are wide um, and, and deep as well, because in the post-Brexit environment, I, I've been advising organisations since 2017, 2018 on how to de-risk their EU business, if you like and start looking at different markets um, beyond uh, the EU. So those these transitions are um, can be difficult. So we need to make sure that we have a trade agreement that facilitates that. And many large companies have already got the resources, but I think there's a real opportunity for this trade agreement to have a really strong SME chapter that supports SMEs um, in being able to trade with each other between the UK and Turkey. I think um, a, lot of, a lot of the work we do as the expert advisory group on trade is we, we, we're, asked, we're asked to consult by Department for International Trade. What do we think can happen in the Switzerland agreement or what do we think about GCC and UK trade agreement and so on and so forth. So we've contributed to these sort of thoughts, but the recurring theme is also the SMEs. The vast majority of UK exporters um, in terms of numbers of companies are SMEs, but the value of the exports that they do in terms of dollars is much lower. So for instance, approximately 10% of our exports globally um, yeah, uh, is done by um, very large companies, corporates, MNCs, uh, in, in terms of the numbers of the companies that do exports. But actually the value in terms of dollars is 50% of our global trade, 55% of our global trade is held by 10% of the companies in terms of number. So you flip that around 90%, generate 55 percent so if if our 90 percent can get even bigger then there's real opportunities for trade um, across the world so and i think smes underpin most economies um, and i'm sure that the turkish economy is the same that most of it is delivered through smes so uh, we look forward to that process in terms of uh working with DAKE on that and our governments on that area thank you thank you alistair actually uh I mean, you mentioned uh, how uh, IOD is influential uh, on bringing the uh, ideas, the uh, feedback from the ground, from the businesses uh, into the uh, policy makers. That's how uh, they can gear also works in their areas, actually. Uh, both uh, institutions are the umbrella institutions. Uh, they is uh, not related with any specific uh, industry. It covers all the industries, including trade, manufacturing, Manufacturing everything, uh, and it has uh, more than two thousand companies as members, but uh, also uh, more than hundred of institutions uh, from Turkey. So uh, its members' uh, base is 
uh, more or less covers all around Turkey and uh, every kind of uh, businesses. And it has, like IOD, has very uh, close connections with the legislative makers, policy makers. Uh, and we are very uh, strong in uh, bringing the feedback from the businesses into the uh, legislation. And I'm sure that uh, our input for the a new form of the free trade agreement, uh, the feedbacks uh, both from IOD and DAIC will be very valuable for our governments uh, to take actions accordingly, uh, as well as GIODER actually. Uh, Mehmet Bey is now is going to give an uh, information about GIODER, but GIODER is also an umbrella organization specifically focused on real estate uh, business. So uh, while mentioning you, uh, Mehmet Bey, uh, I would like to ask you uh, in an introduction um, of Gyoder, as well as uh, can you give us a uh, very general view uh, about the real estate market in Turkey and what could be the opportunities for the UK investors or what could be any kind of collaboration opportunities uh, between two countries uh, for real estate markets? Thank you very much, Özlem Hanım, and uh, all the panelists supporting uh, this webinar to happen. Apologies, uh, just, just a reminder for uh, Mehmet, uh, when you're ready, if you share your screen and then you can present your slides. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me open uh, the presentation. Um, our institution, Gyoder, basically um, founded for the real estate uh, investment trusts in Turkey. Uh, the time, let me share my screen. Um, is my screen? Uh, yeah, we okay. can see. We can see okay. yours. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was founded in uh, nineteen ninety nine. And that was the uh, time uh, during the legislation for real estate investment trusts were taking place in Turkey. But uh, our aim was to increase the effectiveness of real estate investment trusts. Later on, uh, real estate investment funds and uh, real estate certificates and other um, stock uh, market uh, instruments became uh, our uh, area of expertise and representation uh, as from the sector. But uh, to do that, we also needed to uh, we also needed to touch on the problems of uh, real estate sector. Uh, so uh, these are the areas where our institution started to uh, operate. This is our board. Uh, so I will uh, move quickly. There are people from real estate developers, real estate investment trusts, architects, uh, consultancy companies, uh, from representatives of big four to contractors to tourism companies. So we are trying and startups. Uh, we are trying to cover all the value chain of built environment in our uh, NGO, and these are the committees which are. Uh, the um, production uh, centers of our uh, NGO. Each committee also has a team of uh, 10 to 15 people so that we are really putting the joint effort and joint ideas together and uh, bringing our feedbacks and recommendations to the decision makers uh, in the government and also sharing these uh, with a uh, greater public. Uh, our members is our, uh, our strength, like any other business uh, non-governmental organization. We are trying to be, bring people together. And also this year, we started to, to increase the international relations uh, in this term. Uh, publicly, we are uh, trying to increase the uh, image of real estate sector, which needs an increase uh, in Turkey. Uh, and also 
uh, communication and lobbying is uh, very important. Our uh, institution is not only, uh, doesn't only consist of uh, uh, directors, uh, I can say, uh, but uh, all the uh, all the players from different levels uh, of real estate sectors are involved in GIODER activities. Uh, as I said, international uh, diplomacy in uh, increasing commercial activity uh, between these countries, United States, uh, UK and UAE, uh, has just started and we are trying to uh, make meaningful connections. We have four areas that we can simplify, which is technology in real estate and construction. Uh, for that purpose, we uh, founded a center as we call PropTech Hub to support PropTech startups in Turkey. Uh, art and design is also one key area of Gyoder. Nature is one key area. For that, we are working very closely with our governments for the establishment of Turkey's local green building certificate. And society, of course, is one area. We support projects that give back to society. And as Gyoder, as uh, bringing the sector together, we are also uh, promoting social uh, impact projects. And we call these four principles are holding uh, our roof together, uh, which is uh, which every economy needs a roof, uh, so that the uh, impact of real estate sector is high in terms of socio-economic terms, but also in environmental terms. So we are uh, trying our best to balance that. Our key event is Real Estate Summit, which is going to be uh, 17th this year on October 25th. Everybody is invited. Uh, this year, uh, we will we are trying to do uh, a very good summit. We do Developing Cities Summit. Uh, these were made uh, from Bursa to Konya, Gaziantep, Izmir, uh, cities of Turkey developing really fast, uh, but not as popular as Istanbul. Uh, our target is to make uh, this summit also outside Turkey. Uh, to see and understand the dynamics of developing cities. Uh, we were representing Turkey, Turkey and Istanbul at MIPIM. And uh, I met with Richard uh, at MIPIM. It was a very fruit, fruitful uh, organization. And we are trying to increase these kind of uh, activities as Guyoder. Uh, our solution platform is a platform that we listen to the problems of the sector, we find common problems and try to uh, create uh, solutions for that and uh, present this to decision makers. Uh, we did eight of these and uh, it is uh, very respected from the sector and uh, it is found very, very valuable. This is one of our social responsibility project. We are doing a uh, student dormitory for uh, girl girl students, uh, which will be opened uh, next week. We have uh, a cooperation that is uh, awarding uh, academic research uh, and bringing this research together as a publication. Uh, and our academ academy is also uh, very active. So these are publications. Data is very important in our sector. We need sustainable, dependable data. These are the reports that uh, Gliodar organizes. Um, it, these can be found in our website. And uh, uh, this uh, report is very important, potential investment opportunities, which is gathering together uh, areas of uh, real estate investments. Uh, we uh, we announce home new home price indexes. So uh, just giving uh, an idea overall, uh, and I will uh, sum it up. So this uh, on uh, top left is the share of real estate investment uh, in total FDI, which is uh, uh, which is uh, very good. So an increasing by year by year, and I think it will uh, be 
uh, more in upcoming years uh, because of Turkey's uh, competitive uh, uh, lira policy. Uh, as you see on uh, top right, the main market in real estate is housing in Turkey because of our demography, uh, increasing population, uh, young generation, and it will be like that maybe next 20, 30 years. Um, the units that are being sold in Turkey is around 1.4 million per year, which is a high, very high number. And you see the distribution between first sale and second hand sale. Uh, the share of uh, buyers from abroad is uh, around 5% of general sales, but it is increasing and government increased uh, the citizenship program, which was I think around $200,000 uh, to $400,000. And uh, also, I, th I know that uh, they are working on a uh, uh, program which is not providing citizenship, but uh, um, other, uh, other opportunities. Office market is saturated, uh, I can say, uh, like the rest of the world. Uh, but one of one uh, one of the very important project, which is Istanbul Financial Center, is going to be opened this year. By the end of this year, uh, it is also going to uh, affect the office market very much. And uh, if we look at non-residential markets, uh, the most promising, uh, one of the most promising, is I can say definitely logistics uh, because Turkey's infrastructure is the newest among Europe and is the cleanest among Europe. Uh, the share of uh, renewables in Turkey is 53% and it is increasing year by year. Our roads, airports and all the infrastructure is providing new clean uh, infrastructure for all the sectors. That's why logistics is uh, going to grow uh, in Turkey. Uh, tourism is also uh, very, very uh, active. Uh, there are now uh, projects uh, ongoing. Uh, one of them is Peninsula Hotel in Istanbul. They only have 10 hotels and uh, they are opening their 11th in Istanbul. And they are, as the operator, investing 50% of the uh, real estate also. Uh, Bulgari Hotel is under development. Four Seasons is going to open its third hotel uh, in Bodrum. Uh, Mandarin Hotel just opened second hotel in Turkey, in Istanbul. And third one is uh, under construction in Istanbul. So you can see the high-end uh, operators are very, very interested in Tur Turkey. Why uh, Turkey is... Uh, um, does uh, Turkey offers opportunity is because, uh, as I said, our infrastructure is the newest and the cleanest so that uh, our uh, infrastructure is suitable with ESG standards. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, Istanbul airport, which we are uh, one of the founders, is the biggest building after Pentagon in the world. It is also the largest building that has LEED Gold certificate. So uh, buildings like uh, this in this scale are uh, being done under uh, sustainable principles. And, uh, and very interesting thing that I re remember now that after uh, we won the tender of the Istanbul airport, first person called was uh, the ambassador of UK. So it is an uh, example of uh, how UK is uh, interested in Turkey's economy and uh, vice versa. And we did very, very fruitful uh, connections, meetings with British Aviation Group. I hope we can uh, reach the same in the uh, real estate sector. Uh, as I said, ESG is very uh, seriously implied in Turkey and the growth of e-commerce is uh, providing new opportunity, as I said, in logistics and also in data centers. Uh, which is a newly uh, it is an area that it is newly being uh, developed. 
And uh, tourism is uh, again important. Uh, Turkey is the sixth most visited tourism destination. And I know that this summer there will be a huge, very big demand from UK. As I uh, saw the forecast of uh, airlines that are trying to increase the connections between cities of Turkey and uh, UK. So maybe developing real estate uh, in Turkey as uh, second homes or uh, vacation homes for UK citizens is a, is a good idea. And Turkey's uh, healthcare system is very well developed. As we saw in during COVID, we haven't seen scenes like people overcrowded in uh, hospitals, trying, uh, waiting their lines. Uh, we didn't see these scenes because our health uh, system is very well organized. These are uh, how our tax uh, implications are uh, in uh, real estate. And uh, uh, this is in summary. You see value added tax from 1% to 18%. Government is trying to also simplify these issues. So they uh, recently said that every kind of real estate is 8% value added tax. Uh, normally it was uh, calculated on the price uh, of the units. And real estate investment trusts and real estate investment funds are exempted from uh, tax. Uh, so it's a big advantage. You can follow us uh, from our social media. Uh, and I hope uh, after this webinar, we will increase the collaboration and try to uh, create mini meaningful connections between UK and Turkey in built environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mehmet Bey. Uh, I mean, we have, uh, I'm sure that we, uh, the audience, especially from the UK, got an uh, background information about the Turkish real estate market, how strong it is, how residential market dominates the uh, Turkish real estate market. But uh, as it's a general approach for all the uh, for the, uh, for all the other uh, real estate markets, actually, in the Europe, uh, the various residential uh, market will stay strong in Turkey, it's for sure, especially with the citizenship uh, program by investment. Uh, it's uh, highly attractive for the Middle Eastern investors, but uh, the other uh, commercial real estate types, such as you mentioned, the hospitality, uh, data centers, uh, student housing or uh, logistics especially, which gives the opportunity for the international investors to hedge their investment in terms of currency, especially logistics and hospitality, uh, they will be seen that uh, th uh, they will be very interesting for the international investors. Uh, such tourism is a big market in Turkey and logistics is very important because of the very unique location of Turkey connecting the Europe with all the Middle East and uh, CIS countries. Thank you for, for that. And uh, Richard, uh, now uh, it's your turn to give us an inside view about the IOD uh, property and uh, built environment group. And uh, as well as uh, for your first question, I would like to um, ask you about the opportunities in the UK market, real estate market. It seems that the, every year, you know, PwC and uh, ULI is uh, writing a uh, report, uh, Europe, uh, emerging, mar uh, emerging trends in real estate uh, report. And in this year's report that London seems again uh, as the first uh, position, uh, gained the first position again after a couple of years uh, for prospects. So uh, it's also seen that uh, the, there is a, a shift from the uh, investment into the office market, for example, into the residential market in all forms, such as built to rent or student housing or care homes. 
So, I mean, uh, in the light of these information, uh, what could be the opportunities for Turkish investors or for or Turkish contractors in the uh, UK real estate market? Thank you very much, Aslam. And, and I hope by going through some of my presentation, I can answer the questions because I do actually have a few things that, that I hope will, will, will give an answer to some of the questions you mentioned. So, um, so thank you very much for that. And thank you to all the other speakers for their incredibly valuable contributions. Uh, nice to see you again, everyone. Richard Nelson here, Chair of the Property and Built Environment Group for the Institute of Directors. Um, and just a quick plug on the social media. Here's the link for our LinkedIn page uh, on this title page for you to see. Um, but you can also search for us on LinkedIn and find us fairly easily. So um, I'll just give a quick overview of our group and then talk a little bit about the UK market conditions and answer Aslam's questions in the, in the context of that as well. Um, next slide, please. So what are we all about? As, as a special interest group within the Institute of Directors, um, we focus on the property and the built environment, and that's a major contribution to the UK economy. When you put it all together, real estate, construction, infrastructure, and the businesses working in that sector contribute around 13% to the UK's GDP. So we're, we're not a small voice when it comes to speaking with government. Um, but we are a bit of an old industry. Anyone who works in the industry knows that it's quite traditional in many ways, and it's also quite fragmented. Um, and therefore, there's a real pressure for us to modernize and innovate, um, particularly in the post-Brexit world, when we need to be a lot more efficient and productive um, because we have a much smaller labor pool to pull from. Uh, and we're seeing some of the results of that recently, which you may have seen in the news. Um, but in the construction sector and real estate sector, um, it's made up of quite a lot of SMEs. If you see the, the final bullet on this page, approximately 20% of the SMEs in London are in property and construction. And that's a significant number. It nods back to Alistair's comments earlier around SMEs and how they, um, they make up a large percentage of the companies operating, but not necessarily the value. So we're trying to do what we can to help them grow as businesses. Uh, next slide, please. So our group, Property and Built Environment, is a center of excellence for our members who share this interest. We look after directors, leaders, up and coming leaders in the property and built environment industry. And we wanna bring their voice to government using the IOD's machinery with policy voice and the access we have to government offices and really highlight the issues and raise them and help do something about it to solve any problems. Um, we also wanna be an inclusive community and the vital resource for directors. Um, going back to some of what Alistair told us about the IOD's mission of, of connect, develop, and influence. And also, ultimately, it's about growing our businesses and the skills of our directors in running those businesses um, to avoid problems, as we may have seen in the past with certain companies um, going into administration. Um, a lot of that comes down to you know, competent leadership and good leadership. Uh, next slide, please. So in line with the three pillars of the, um, of the um, Institute of Directors value proposition, in terms of connecting our members, very similar to the way Gyodor works in terms of bringing together people for panel discussions, roundtables, and so forth, webinars such as this. Um, we're also starting to do site tours, which is something new for us. So we'll be going around to various sites in London to see how they've developed and impacted the local environment. Um, develop is an important piece that we've is fairly new for us in property and built environment group in, in the IOD, but we have an incredible body of professional development knowledge within the IOD itself on being better directors for a better world. We're going to tailor some of that to our members that work in property and the built environment and offer them some resources in association with some partners, uh, perhaps Gator itself, um, but also some other organizations that we're teaming up with. And then on the influence side, getting involved with our policy team to input into government, conduct some research um, and through our industry collaborations, as well as raising our profile in the media uh, as well. So uh, next slide, please. We've put together a fantastic team. It's grown. We only had a few members uh, on the board of the Property and Built Environment Group a few years ago. We're now up to nine, which you see here. Uh, I won't name them all. Um, but we have a group that covers all of the responsibilities of a professional organization, um, again, as a special interest group within the IOD. So we work hand in hand with the IOD's head office uh, and the team there to help put on 
all of our activities and to leverage the strength of the organization. So um, just a nod to my team there, a fantastic group to work with, and uh, I'm sure we'll be growing in the future. So um, next slide, please. The approach that we have in terms of the themes and the topics that we're focused on are very similar to Gyodar, actually. Um, we look at the key themes that our, that our members say are important to them. Um, so investment is probably first and foremost. Um, sustainability is on everybody's minds these days, and that's across the, the triple E, so the environmental, economic, and uh, sorry, and social. Um, infrastructure is key. Uh, we're not just about real estate, we're about infrastructure and construction as well, and the two go very much hand in hand. Um, technology is very important. It's impacting the industry in a, in a massive way, um, and we're very interested in seeing how that can develop and, and support the industry in the future. Um, design is something that's close to my heart. I've worked in architecture and, and design for a long time. Um, so it's very important that we design our buildings and places uh, with people in mind and, and make sure that that value is there at the end of the day. And then that last but not least, international. And it's through bilateral um, events like this and looking at sharing best practice and resources um, between us and our partners, as well as facilitating for our members who work internationally uh, business connections for them. Next, please. Um, to this end, we've got an absolutely packed calendar. Um, we used to be pre-pandemic, we, we did approximately two events per year. Um, now, as you can see, we're doing quite a bit more than that. Um, and it's because everybody wants to get back to networking and being with each other. And that's how we learn, how we grow, how we make connections and do business. Um, so on a monthly basis, we're getting together for what we call the third Wednesday PBE Connect events. Um, and we're, we're fortunate enough to have a wonderful champagne bar at the IOD headquarters at 116 Pall Mall. So we have them there. Um, but we also have other events around learning, development, and growing growth for our members. Um, so today's event is a perfect example. It's giving everybody the opportunity to learn about um, the opportunities in Turkey and, and vice versa for tur our Turkish guests to learn about the opportunities in the UK. Um, we'll be touring the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park next month. We've got an opportunity to do an, an event on transport oriented developments in the autumn and, and so forth. Uh, and we'll be looking into much more in depth opportunities for the next year as well. So, next, please. We also realize that we don't have all the answers ourselves. And so, we are looking to partner with other organizations where we can share content and research and get involved in professional development. So, uh, to that end, we, we have a partnership that we launched with New London Architecture earlier this year, and we'll be sharing some resources with them going forward. UK Reef is an organization that I'm on the advisory board for. This is the new UK Real Estate Investment and Infrastructure Forum. And, and I can say for, for Turkish investors in particular, it is the one place where you can get an absolute mountain of information about the opportunities in the UK real estate market. Um, I, I hesitate to call it a mini MIPIM for the UK because they, they want to have their own reputation and not be always compared to MIPIM. Um, but if you've been to MIPIM, then you'll get an idea of what UK Reef is like. It's just focused on the UK market primarily. So a uh, really good organization. And we're also looking at the uh, social and academic partnerships that we can establish links within the IOD. Um, so, for example, we have a relationship with London South Bank University, and we're hoping to build on that with their construction and real estate program. Uh, also, institutions like the Bartlett School at the University College London um, and social organizations like Black Professionals in Construction, who we've been speaking with as well. Uh, next, please. So the future for us going forward is continuing to push on the professional development side and offer some real opportunities for growth to our members, um, building further partnerships um, that's both in the UK and abroad with other organizations, growing our membership, of course, is, is one of our top responsibilities, um, but then engaging in policy to allow that to happen, to give us that influence that we need as the organization uh, instituted directors. Sponsorships are key because we need those low, those wonderful partners to uh, to help us um, fund and develop our programs. So we're looking for sponsors to partner with and and help them grow as well because we can be a platform for them to reach out to to our market. Um, and going national is an important one. Um, the IOD, as Alistair mentioned earlier, is is national and international in scope. 
Um, and to date, the Property and Built Environment Group has largely been operating in London, um, but we've had a few conversations with colleagues in places like Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, uh, about branching out nationally and, and covering those major markets as well. So that's quite important to, to the future of our organization. Um, so turning now a bit to hopefully answering Aslam's early questions about the UK economy and the UK real estate market. Uh, next, please. Um, just a bit of an overview, um, some data recently on what's happening in the UK market. Um, GDP was up in the UK very slightly in the first quarter, but it's now turned to a situation where it's, it's slowing or falling. Um, in March, GDP shrank by 0.1%. Um, in, in services and manufacturing, they were down by 0.2%. But interestingly, construction was up 1.7%. Now, uh, anyone who's been working in construction long enough will know that, that the industry is, has about a six-month lag on the general economy. So um, while the numbers look very good in construction right now, there's potential for some headwind uh, going into the rest of 2022 and into 2023. Um, not least of which is related to things like interest rates and inflation, supply chain issues, certainly the Ukraine conflict and geopolitics. Um, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the issues um, related to um, um, shared challenges. And um, uh, I think, you know, there's going to be there's going to be a little bit more to come in terms of um, economic confidence. Uh, that's that's one of the key things that drives investment decisions is confidence. Um, the IOD, in fact, does a director economic confidence index, and we just released the May survey, and it's at its lowest since October 2020. So that will weigh on investment decisions going forward. Uh, next, please. Um, Aslam mentioned the uh, Urban Land Institute and PwC survey, obviously a resource that we pay attention to as well. Um, and, and yes, London is traditionally a great market for real estate investment, as you can see here. Um, from Q4 2020 to Q3 21, London was the biggest investment market in Europe for real estate at 16 billion euros. Um, and in fact, in terms of going forward for 22, 23, the real estate prospects, um, we've got four major cities in the top 31 that you see on the right hand side of the screen. So London leading the list. Um, but also Manchester, Birmingham, and Edinburgh. Um, and that's important in reflecting back to what Alistair said about the IOD as a national organization. We cover all of the UK and international. And I think um, it's important that as part of our government's leveling up agenda, and as we all know, our, our key cities outside of London do have something to offer for foreign investors and real estate investors, especially if you're looking for better growth in terms of yields and capital uh, return than, than you would necessarily find in a very competitive market such as London. So um, I think the UK regions is an interesting opportunity for, for UK, uh, sorry, for Turkish investors um, to, to pay attention to. Uh, next, please. Um, going into this year in terms of capital investment in real estate, um, there was about 19.4 billion in the first four months which funny enough, it gives us our best start since, 19, uh, since 2015. Um, so we do have a little bit to be, to be happy for. Um, that may change going into the back end of the year, it remains to be seen. Interestingly, overseas capital accounts for over half of that number. Um, so we keep hearing and we keep seeing there, there is a weight of capital from around the world targeting real estate. It just comes down to that confidence index that I mentioned earlier, and we really need to see that start to turn around um, if we're gonna if we're gonna have as good of uh, uh, end of the year as we did the beginning of the year, next please. Um, our colleagues from Savills we do a lot of work with, and they've given us a really great UK cross sector outlook as you can see here. Um, some of the key highlights that I wanted to mention, and these are very similar I think in, into some of the highlights we've heard from the Turkish market. Um, industrial and distribution are two very, you know, front of the line. They're, they're leading uh, the in real estate investment sector right now and also construction. And, and there's some reasons for that, some very specific reasons for that is this shift to online retail, which has been an absolute uh, boom, uh, especially since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so the online retail um, sales, um, which on the, unfortunately that's negatively affected retail investment in terms of bricks and mortar. Um, but it's a massive positive investment uh, in the industrial and distribution sector. Um, last mile delivery has become 
um, a very important thing as well. I mean, I've got, I know from my own experience, sometimes I order from Amazon in the morning and it's there by the afternoon. Even, even if I didn't say I need it by the afternoon, it shows up anyway. Um, so it just shows the attention they're putting into last mile delivery infrastructure. Um, let land is an interesting one, and that's come onto Savile's um, list as a very high priority in terms of capital growth and potential yield growth down the road, a little bit more long term on the yields. Um, but land is important because of a couple of reasons. Certainly, the Ukraine conflict has highlighted our need to have a bit more security in our agriculture stock. And so looking to get land uh, to be a bit more productive locally in the UK is an important thing. But also with the government's drive to go net zero by 2050, carbon sequestration is another opportunity for land stocks. Um, so that is driving the opportunity in, in turning uh, livestock land, for example, into these uh, sequestration sites. Um, we talked about residential in, in Turkey as a strong market. It's very strong in the UK and, and, and Aslam actually mentioned it's interesting how the market here is maturing and there are some subsectors that are coming through. Um, uh, Purpose-built student accommodation has become a mature sector in the UK over the last couple of years. Now, build to rent is now seen as a mature sector as well. Um, you're getting to the point now where we've got a lot of institutional investors um, flooding into that market and therefore the returns may be a bit more modest, but they're very secure and stable. Uh, and that's the important thing to recognize in that sector that there's a long-term growth aspect to it now. Um, and that will filter into other parts of the residential sector, such as affordable housing, which there's some serious um, room for growth in that. And it's, it's seen as an alternative right now, but it may be time, time to start looking at it as more mainstream. Um, and also things like senior housing. Senior housing is a very important sector that needs to grow in the UK. Um, a lot of the reason it hasn't grown so much in the past is because we've had some trouble getting the right operators into that sector, but they're, they're now coming and they're in the market, so there'd be a lot of growth there. Offices are a bit um, moribund right now, but there's some room for change, and I think what we're seeing with investors in, in the sector there on offices is it's about changing the ESG credentials of the office. It's making it more sympathetic to hybrid working, more sympathetic to you know, larger spaces for different uses. It's not just people sitting at a desk working anymore. We can do that from our homes and anywhere we want if we're office workers. Um, it's about those collaboration spaces, those workspaces, maybe some private space for, for thinking and contemplating. Um, but the office environment is ripe for change and, and we see not necessarily massive returns in the next couple of years, but certainly a lot of change which from a design and construction standpoint will present some opportunities. And then there's some alternative sectors that are quite strong. Um, as the UK looks to reskill its workforce, um, because as I mentioned earlier, we've lost quite, an, quite a workforce um, pulling out of the EU. Um, so we need to do the reskilling effort. And there, so there's a big push in education um, at, at vocational and technical level, as well as university level. Um, and that has a strong social value. So for firms, for, for investors who are looking for that, the S part of the ESG component, there's a strong social value in, in education. Data centers um, was mentioned earlier as well, and it, it's not on the Savos list there, but it is a massive, massive market. Um, it's looking at about 13% annual growth per annum uh, from now through 2027. Um, and interestingly, um, you know, I read a, nice, a recent story in uh, The Economist last week about how um, the, the, the big issue in data centers right now is connecting to the grid. We don't have enough electricity to power all these data centers. Um, so between the growth in battery storage facilities, the growth in data centers, and generally the growth in, in other sectors like residential, there's just not enough to go around. In fact, West London uh, Ealing issued a letter telling developers that they may not be able to connect to the grid with the right capacity until 2027 to 2030. Um, and I know a colleague, uh, Mustafa Erdem, is on, on, the, on the call today, and uh, he's, he's a counselor and uh, he's a um, director of the Hounslow Chamber of Commerce, so he probably knows exactly what I'm talking about. Data centers, it's, it's an important sector, but it's one that we have to keep up with on the infrastructure side, and therein might be some opportunities for Turkish investors, particularly if you're involved in renewables, which you can see comes in at the bottom of my list, just under affordable housing there. Um, I'll come back to affordable housing um, quickly. There's, a, again, a big social value there. There's room to grow in that sector. It's a long-term stable income because it's got government-backed guarantees. 
So that's another sector that, that there's some potential opportunity in. Um, and community energy, particularly when you think about rural communities outside the big cities in the UK, um, there is a big reliance on gas and, uh, and other sources of um, power um, for their electricity. And as we convert to mostly electric, renewables is going to have to be the answer to help those communities develop the, these energy systems. So again, back to the, back to the renewable energy as a, uh, as a growth market for the UK where Turkish firms may be able to, to invest and help out. Um, in terms of how Turkish investors might find opportunities in the UK, I just wanted to highlight a couple of new resources that are available. Um, they're, they're by subscription, but you can certainly look for um, a bit of, there's a bit of free information available online through these. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one is the Opportunity London website, and this is through our colleagues at New London Architecture. They've set this up as a resource working with the Mayor of London, London First, London Partners, a couple other organizations. Um, but Opportunity London is an online, online database that's around promoting sustainable real estate investment and really highlighting regeneration and green infrastructure opportunities for foreign investors, for, for any investors, but of course, foreign investors as well. You can actually click on each borough to go borough by borough. Uh, next slide. And it, you can drill in and it'll give you a bit of an overview of the, of the key investment areas that the borough is highlighting and wants to focus on. Um, and areas for best developments. And it gives you a bit of background and statistics, how the shape and structure of the, of the particular area works. This is uh, Kensington and Chelsea that you can see on the screen. And you can see there are key areas um, around the Earl's Court area. And then in the, on the Northern part, um, just up against the city of Westminster and Brent. Um, so it's quite a, an in, interesting resource for investors to, to use. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and it also goes in and shows some highlights of key investment areas, which you can see the descriptions of here. Um, but critically, it also gives you the contact information. So you have someone to reach out to, to have a conversation about the opportunity and how to drill in and where you might start to make some connections uh, to look more in depth at these, in, at these opportunities. So I encourage you to have a look at the Opportunity London website. You can see the address on the bottom of the screen there, opportunity.london. Um, and there is another one, uh, next slide, um, which has come out of the UK Real Estate and Investment Infrastructure Forum that I mentioned earlier, which is the Real Estate and Infrastructure Investment Database. Um, I don't have, I have just this one slide on, on the Read database, but it's basically looking more UK wide. So not just London, but all the other major cities and major areas of the UK. And this will connect public sector and landowners with private sector investors and developers. So it's a big resource to highlight all the major opportunities and, and the big opportunity areas around the UK and to make connections between developers, investors, and the landowners and public sector in particular who owns quite a lot of the land in these major cities. Um, so these are some very interesting resources to pay attention to. Uh, and, and finally, next slide, um, just a nod to the previous discussion on, on UK Turkey uh, direct investment both ways. Um, we've got a bit of um, statistics 2020, the, the FDI into UK from Turkey was 260 million from UK to Turkey, 7.1 billion. That's from our own uh, Office of National Statistics. Um, but that doesn't necessarily talk about the commerce that's done between the countries because that's those numbers may be substantially higher. Um, I know a lot of uh, UK companies who are working in Turkey in the fields that I'm involved in, which cover architecture, engineering, construction, um, but also a lot of Turkish investors and, and Turkish companies coming to the UK to, to source opportunities and work. A couple of names on the screen, Turkish companies I know of in the property and built environment sector who are working in the UK. So Antiapi and, and Picker Holding. Um, but the, yeah, I think the message to take away from today is, is we would like to encourage more. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, you know, um, Osman's comment about third country collaborations is another important area to explore, um, which perhaps, uh, Aslam, we can talk about that during the Q&A session. So um, thank you very much. And uh, back to Aslam. Uh, thank you, Richard. Actually, I was going to ask uh, to you uh, if we have uh, some time for the Q&A because uh, we are about to arrive to the uh, announced timing. So if we can ah. have uh, 10 minutes more, I don't know. Uh, do you want me to continue or uh, close the session?
I think we, we can probably continue for those who are able to stay around. Um, I don't, okay. I don't mm -hmm. think we'll be kicked out at exactly 1315. I'm not sure. Jess can probably tell us if we will be. Um, give us a bit <laughs> okay. Of a Okay, thank you. I mean, uh, that was an amazing uh, presentation, like all the others, uh, but uh, definitely uh, I'm seeing that there are a lot of collaboration opportunities in real estate market, uh, both sides, I mean, in Turkey and also in the UK market. I would like to uh, add something uh, which you have just mentioned about affordable housing and direct my question to Alistair. Uh, in, con uh, in connection with that, actually. I'm observing, you know, I'm in the real estate market in the UK uh, for some time, also in the construction market as well. So I'm observing that uh, the main demand, one of the main demands in the residential market is coming from the affordable housing. All the boroughs, all the municipalities are trying to uh, reach to the targeted affordable housing uh, numbers. So uh, they just, uh, I mean, um, want the investors to uh, locate or uh, support uh, affordable housing in that uh, sense. But uh, also looking back to the, uh, in detail, to the construction uh, sector, uh, I've just read that uh, BOD's uh, latest uh, sectoral survey on construction, the biggest challenges, which we all know in the UK construction sector, are seen as labor shortages, uh, material shortages, and prices. So, I mean, uh, that is that makes the construction itself uh, very uh, uh, costly, pricely, and not to meeting the affordable housing uh, needs, actually. So in that context, I was, I was thinking that the uh, offshore construction, the model of construction can be a good response for meeting that kind of uh, requirements about the affordable housing. And um, I, I was thinking that uh, in uh, Turkey can be one of the uh, one of the candidate countries that uh, UK can collaborate on, the, on those uh, modular uh, construction uh, in terms of uh, lowering the cost of the labor, which Turkey uh, definitely is one of the lowest in the whole Europe. Uh, it's not so far, just uh, bringing the materials like from the Far East, uh, it's uh, nearby uh, in the Eastern Europe. So, I mean, uh, in terms of these, Alistair, how do you see that kind of uh, collaboration opportunities between UK and Turkey? Because we, ha we have been talking with you about of manufacturing, uh, collaboration in manufacturing, and that uh, that gives, gave me a kind of uh, thought when Alice, uh, Richard was mentioning about the need for uh, affordable housing. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, uh, thank you, Ozum. Yeah, the I, I, and this is definitely the opportunity. Uh, and Richard might want to add some comments after I've finished. The the, the challenge that UK has um, is for successive governments have promised that several hundreds of thousands of uh, houses will be built every year. Um, and the question has always been where they're going to be built, who builds them, how they're built, and so on. So. And it's also then there's the question of, of the affordability. So a lot of housing developments outside of cities um, have to have a mix of houses in those developments. They, they're not allowed to get the planning permission to go ahead unless there are certain houses that are worth a certain amount and then others are a, another amount. And, and in fact, you know, where I live in Sussex, there are you know, plans for 3,000 houses getting built and 1,000 houses are going to be affordable housing and 2,000 will be uh, local market prices in inverted commas. So there's a lot of work going on um, policy and regulation wise. What happens also with affordable housing is that um, when you're going to build lots and lots of houses in areas, oftentimes those local markets push back on the basis that their own house price will, will come down because there's oversupply in inverted commas. So um, the government is trying to wrestle with different bits of the market um, and the banks and availability of mortgages for different people and so on and so forth. But the, the, the key question is um, how the challenges are there. How do we overcome them? And 
um, the, the modular approach was mentioned um, uh, just yesterday um, in, in some of the media, they were talking about the modular approach to housing. And I know that Turkey, from my time in the Middle East, I know that Turkey's got very, very strong experience in modular construction. Um, and there were some big Turkish companies all over the Middle East with different levels of mod modular construction, be it uh, remote location stuff or to um, houses, like, you know, that would be absolutely uh, uh, beautiful houses. And I think that there's also um, a market um, awareness as well. In the UK, when people think of modular, uh, they think of um, porter cabins and basic, whereas actually modular can be quite luxurious. Um, so I think there's a bit of work to be done on the marketing side as well, if I may say that. Richard may, uh, again, as, as the expert in this area, will probably add, add a few bits. But uh, so I think that the uh, your point about skills and materials, materials is one thing. If you go to a construction expo here in the UK, you'll find all the major construction groups are there, but they're represented by their HR departments trying to sell construction as a um, as a career. And they have lots of pictures of um, people with laptops and trying to encourage women in the industry and so on and so forth. So I think there's that opportunity there as well. Uh, but equally, the supply element, if materials are becoming more expensive, then we have to seek alternatives to those materials. And if, if that alternative is modular, then we have to do some marketing to um, overcome some pre -misconce misconceptions about what modular housing actually looks like. Richard? Yeah, no, I would agree with everything that Alistair is saying. And interestingly, you know, in thinking about the UK-Turkey Free Trade Agreement that was initiated a couple of years ago, it, it focuses a lot on manufacturing, but everybody always misses the fact that that, that construction is moving to more manufacturing model. Um, and, you know, we've done a great deal when it comes to machinery and automobile parts and things like that between the countries. But if we can start looking at opportunities to, to consider manufactured construction, uh, maybe that can fall into some of those incentives to make it a bit easier and more cost efficient to do business in, in, in that way. I think, um, as Alice just said, there is a lot of, lot of impetus, um, and I mentioned it in my presentation as well, this idea of modernizing and innovating in the industry. Um, modular and offsite is, is taking off. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's looking for ways to do it. Certainly, what's interesting in the UK is all of our designers and engineers, and, and I can see my colleague, John Griffiths from WT Partnership on the, on the Q&A, um, you know, our, across our QSs and, uh, and uh, project managers, we all know conceptually and, and, and um, design-wise how to do it. It's the production capacity that we don't have in the UK to keep up with that demand. If, if there's some answers we can get from our colleagues in Turkey, I think that is well worth exploring. And, and I don't know if Mehmet has any comments in that area, but it's certainly an opportunity for further discussion and growth. No, no question about it. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you, Richard. Uh, uh, I also uh, would like to mention about another area that I think there would be an opportunity because uh, I'm uh, seeing that uh, the UK government is planning to construct around 40 new hospitals uh, until 2030 and to renew the existing 70 of them as well. And uh, you know, Turkey uh, recently in the last five uh, to eight years has uh, constructed uh, big city hospitals, uh, f fully, uh, I mean, uh, equipped and with very big capacities. That's why, I mean, uh, I think Turkey uh, didn't suffer a lot during the uh, early stages of pandemic, uh, I mean, uh, and differentiated itself from the uh, rest of the neighbors, actually. So be because we had a uh, large capacity and the health uh, tourism is uh, growing extremely in the, I don't know, five years, eight years, uh, there is a big uh, health industry, health tourism in Turkey. So, I mean, I found that it's interesting uh, for, an, uh, for another area of collaboration. And maybe we can uh, get the ideas of uh, Mehmet Bey about uh, how uh, he sees about what would be done in, in this area. Also you. yours, Richard and Alistair. Thank you, Özlem Hanım. As you said, uh, last 20 years in Turkey, 
infrastructure in every field from communications to transportation to hospitals to other sectors has boomed and a very big expertise has been raised. Not only uh, contractors, but designers, I mean, MEP companies to any discipline that are very, very uh, well equipped uh, Turkish companies. And the advantage of these companies are they are used to work fast because in Turkey, this infrastructure was needed so badly because, you know, all our economy is dependent on infrastructure. That's why uh, we as a country tried to um, finish our infrastructure as soon as we, we could. Uh, the uh, advantage that Turkish contractors can provide to uh, UK uh, is not only uh, that I think uh, these projects can be done faster under Turkish management, but also, you know, the, if we can use the Turkish workforce, it can also uh, decrease the uh, cost of the project. Maybe for that reason, uh, as far as I know, it is not easy to bring Turkish uh, workforce to UK. Maybe as part of this uh, trade uh, agreement, some steps that they can ease the process could be very um, beneficial to uh, even cooperate better in these fields. I think, I think it's a no brainer. I mean, Turkish companies that finish these scales during these um, timelines can definitely do the same in UK. Uh, and this, uh, again, I think would be for the advantage of UK. But uh, in my opinion, seeing one and or two examples will be very important. For example, in Qatar, in UAE, in Saudi Arabia, uh, Turkey, and now starting in Balkans and East uh, Europe, uh, Turkish contractors are doing the significant, very strategic infrastructure because it is known from an other company or from an engineering company. So the community is bringing themselves together for that market. For the UK, I don't think we took the first step in this field. And this field is just, uh, where we uh, feel strong. And this is one of the areas that which uh, we do our best. So uh, I think it is very, very uh, valuable and it makes uh, a very good sense. Thank you. Uh, Richard, would you like to add uh, anything uh, about his comments? I think, uh, well, just to mention on the, on the hospitals and Alistair may be aware of this as well. Um, he headlines are headlines, what they are in the media. Um, it, it, I think it actually results that there are only three completely brand new hospitals to be built, whereas all the rest of the projects are just uh, extensions and additions to existing hospitals. But our, our politicians love a good headline, don't they? Um, I think the other thing too, and to, to mention um, for, for Mehmet's comment, yes, I think it's it's our government is going to have to address the supply issue, the the employment market issue, at some point. It's it's not a hundred percent clear how they're going to do that yet, but we are going to have to um, get get real in terms of allowing foreign workers into the UK. Um, we've turned off the taps when we made our Brexit decision and now we're paying the price for it. Um, so uh, Alistair may be a bit closer to some of those negotiations than I am or maybe not, um, but it is something that we as an organization in the IOD are continually raising to the government. We, we, we can't keep facing these supply shortages. It will cripple us. Um, so I think, you know, the, the ongoing discussions with, with Turkey and the, the knowledge that we know, you know, the talent we know you have and the help that you can offer is important for us to, to take advantage of. Thank you. Yeah, just to add to, on the hospital's point, the, um, the, the measurement of what constitutes a, a new hospital um, is the thing that causes the challenge. So the headline is 40, but the devil is in the detail. Uh, one thing sort of more longer term, medium, longer term strategically, you can think, um, is that given the backlogs that are currently occurring um, in the NHS in the UK, uh, and my personal view is, I mean, we had a big backlog before the pandemic uh, struck and that backlog has increased significantly. Um, so we, we can anticipate that the private health sector will also um, require additional infrastructure moving forward. Um, I'm sure that the uh, while health services will probably remain free at the point of, of delivery, 
uh, the involvement of the private healthcare sector in delivering some of those services will increase and they will need infrastructure to do that. So um, I, I would say that while the, the government spend on hospitals might be slightly uh, smaller than sort of advertised in inverted commas, um, there you, I don't think you can rule out there would be some growth in the private sector um, for construction. Uh, I'm not sure, but perhaps that is another area uh, uh, to consider. Um, as far as the uh, movement of labour, um, the non-EU migration to the UK has actually increased after Brexit um, and has more than increased than the level of EU migration. So our net overall migration is higher than before Brexit because the EU non-EU numbers. Um, uh, so um, the UK government uh, has put forward a, an immigration policy based on needs of skills and has a list of um, uh, roles and jobs that are classed as uh, ne necess necess necessities for the growth of the UK economy, similar to other countries. Um, and, and different countries are having negotiations on free trade agreements with the UK, and different countries have got different requirements in terms of types of professional movement. So, for instance, some countries uh, want sort of professional services to be opened up. Other countries want different aspects of um, uh, jobs to be opened up. So I'm sure these are discussions that are held on an individual basis between countries uh, and the government will deal with them on an individual basis, I'm sure. Thank you, Alistair. Actually, uh, I've been also witnessing some interest for the uh, private healthcare investments. Uh, especially from Turkey into the UK market, because, you know, uh, we can get the, uh, I mean, uh, the idea from the investor's point of view. We are working uh, from investors, uh, both from Turkey and also from Europe, so into the UK market. So, I mean, uh, there is such kind of interest uh, seeing that uh, opportunity in the, especially in the private healthcare system, actually. As you mentioned, uh, yes, that that's an I think a reality after the COVID uh, for the UK. So, uh, Richard, I think uh, we can close now. If you uh, agree with me, uh, we have used the uh, Q and A uh, part as well. I'm checking if there is any uh, further questions from the audience, but I don't see uh, so. Uh, I would like to thank uh, for being together with us uh, today, our all uh, speakers, all the audience, and uh, especially thank you, uh, Richard, for hosting us. And uh, thank you for your valuable contributions. I mean, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's going to be the first uh, opening uh, webinar for our future activities. As Alistair mentioned, uh, we are also uh, willing to organize uh, trade missions to both countries to, to uh, I mean, uh, strengthen our relations. Also, Mehmet Bey uh, has mentioned about the real estate summit uh, of Giyadar uh, in October. So uh, you're very welcome uh, to join us. Uh, it's going to be uh, the MIPIM of Turkey. <laughs> At some point, it was having the MIPIM Istanbul name as well. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank you uh, all again and looking forward to meet again uh, sooner. Thank you very much, Aslam. And uh, Jess, I just have a couple of final slides to, to wrap things up. Thank you so much, Aslam and, and Mehmet you. for your contributions, Alistair as well, and Osman is gone, but Osman thank you well. very, much, uh, very much as well. Um, so what a, great, um, what a great presentation, a good kickoff, I think, for our cooperation. Um, and we're very much looking forward to working on the next one. Uh, so keep your ears to the ground and we will announce in due course our next uh, um, combined presentation. Um, just a couple before I get into a couple of upcoming events for the IOD, um, from, from Osman's uh, presentation, some things I pulled out, Brexit will strengthen UK-Turkey relations. I think that's absolutely true um, as we look to establish great trade agreements with our partners over the, over, over the world. Um, 
and that um, you know we've certainly targeted each other as, as partners, um, which is a great thing. Um, and there's a lot of complementary capabilities. He also mentioned the third country collaborations. Um, I know from my own experience, it's already happening. Um, the architecture firm that I represent, Scott Brownrig, uh, does a lot of airport work. We've done several airports in Africa, working with Turkish contractors, very, very successful. Uh, we also worked in Turkey on the Istanbul airport, which Mehmet is very close to as well. Um, so I think the opportunities for third country collaboration are, are absolutely uh, important to pursue. Um, and as Alistair mentioned in his uh, presentation, um, IOD is international and is looking to continue to grow internationally. And if we can help uh, Turkish directors become better directors for a better Turkey, uh, we would love to collaborate with, with them on that. So something for us to look at in the future. Um, and um, from Mehmet Bey's presentation, yes, the summit, looking forward to the summit in, in October in Istanbul. Um, we'd love to get back there for that. And I think it is about increasing international relations. It seems our markets are very similar in terms of what's hot and what's not. There are some very subtle differences, obviously, culturally and, and uh, locally. Um, whereas Turkey's got you know a much greater tourism industry to to support than the UK, there are ways we can we can share best practices and knowledge on that as we try and seek to increase uh, the UK's uh, the UK's tourism coming out of the pandemic. Um, but there's a huge amount that that we can learn from each other, um, and really looking forward to that going forward. Um, just two things to highlight for everybody who's still online. We've got the summer economic update with the Bank of England and our chief economist from the IOD, Kitty Usher. That's happening on June 20th. Um, it is an in-person event for IOD members only, um, but I probably suspect that that one will be recorded as well for, for broadcast. We'll certainly do a, a roundup of it afterwards. Um, and next slide, please. Um, we have our next live property and built environment event on July 7th. We will be touring the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park to see the legacy that's taken place over the last 10 years since the 2012 London Olympic Games. Um, and we will be combining this with a summer reception at the New London Architecture Gallery, which recently moved to Westfield, Stratford City. So that will be happening on July 7th. And as you'll see from the link on the bottom, visit, um, sorry, iod.com slash events. You can find all of IOD events, including a number of online events uh, coming up that can be drilled, that can be signed into from overseas. Um, in fact, on 21st of June, we are having a webinar on doing business in China. Um, so we'll have a group looking at the opportunities um, for business in China. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, you'll find that on iod.com slash events. Um, and with that, I'll draw proceedings to the close. Thank you very much. Um, my email is property.london at iod.com. Uh, that's my IOD email. Please, if anyone has any questions, reach out to me. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll make the recording available in due course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Really good to see you.